Okay. I'm going to assume thumbs up. Can you see the screen okay? I can see it. All right. Excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. My name is Jamie Wells, and I'm the director of the Center of Excellence for Careers in Education. We are hosted at Green River College. We are one of 11 centers of excellence in the state, all sort of within the umbrella um, of the state's community and technical college system. And Carrie, I will let you introduce yourself. I am Carrie Pierce. I'm one of the Workforce Development direct, uh, Directors at the Washington State Labor Council, AFL-CIO. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I have my portfolio is um, K-12, um, Registered Apprenticeship, and Community and Technical Colleges. I have been dabbling a little bit in the four-year um, communities, um, but it's um, very strange to me at the moment, so <laughs> I am not authority on that. Um, and um, Jamie and I have been working with advisory committees for a while, and um, this is sort of a um, production of um, the things that we have learned as we've been doing presentations either separately or, or collectively. Awesome. And I've, I've been in the system, the community college system for about 24 years. I started at Highline um, forever ago and I've been at Green River for the last 12 years or so and in this center role for the last six or seven years. Um, and as Carrie mentioned, um, and in, in thinking of this training in particular and why we're here and why we're presenting this information, we attended a training um, several years ago from an expert, um, someone from a community college in the Midwest who focuses on effective employer engagement as well as um, implementing and establishing um, effective advisory boards. So we went through that training and it, it was so well received by everyone in the room. We wanted to be able to take that and then sort of customize it uh, to better suit the needs of the colleges within our state. Um, so we did that and we've sort of been presenting this information um, as we go for colleges that, that need it for large groups, small groups, conferences, whatever. Um, and we keep building on it. We keep adding to it. Um, it it's, we enjoy presenting this and sharing what we've learned and continuing to share um, best practices, challenges, um, things like that. So we're excited to be here with you today and, and share some of what, um, what we know and what we've learned, but then also hopefully listen to and learn from you um, as well. So before we go any further, Chris, how about we start with um, a poll that I know you've got ready for us. I know it takes just a second for everyone to register their answer and then Chris will show us the results. All right. Hey, this is great. Why did you join us today? And just over 80% of you are feeling like you're, you're, there's ways that your committees can be more effective. And also being able to share and see what, what others are doing. Absolutely, it's a great opportunity for that. And of course, there's always a couple, of course, boss makes us go to things like this. We totally get that. And 20% and of you, I'm not sure if I believe you, you just really love Zoom meetings. Well, <laughs> I was one of them, so. <laughs> I felt like I had to participate. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. Okay. Well, the way Carrie and I like to present, we've got a whole bunch of information to share with you, but we also feel like we are an open book. Um, we bounce off each other a lot. If there's something that, a burning question or something that, um, that you want to jump in and ask or you're confused about, by all means, um, please just wave us down or, or, or put something in the chat. Um, 
whatever we can do to help serve you today. Yeah, if I could just say that um, Jamie and I, like we have a formal presentation, um, but we are um, pretty casual in our uh, presentation style. So um, feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, put stuff in the chat. Chris said that she would be monitoring that, so she'll bring that to our attention if um, you're not feeling the desire to interrupt us, <laughs> which is, you're not, really. Absolutely. Okay, so quick session overview. What, what are we going to cover today? Um, one thing that we know is that advisory boards can oftentimes make or break a program. And some of the call, uh, common challenges that we have heard and continue to hear, um, and I'm sure that, that um, some of these will resonate with you, there's never enough members and we struggle to recruit new members or the members that we do have don't seem all that engaged or don't seem like they want to stay or they just flat out end up leaving. And that's a frustration. Not everybody is on the same page necessarily uh, related to the value of engaging with employers. We're, we're busy and have a lot of other things on our plate. We just don't have the time um, that we know we probably need to invest in those relationships. And we hear things too, like longtime board members who maybe are a, a little bit disruptive, maybe they're inflexible. How in the world do you handle a situation like that too? Um, and so, and, and there's many more. That, that's just a quick snapshot, a snapshot of the challenges that we hear and things that we will address today. Some of those major questions and concerns. We also hope to demonstrate the value of strategic long-term partnerships with employers and offer you some tools and strategies for effective engagement and, and ways, to approach, um, ways to approach this work. Why does it why does it even matter? And Carrie, I'm gonna um, feel free to chime in here with me on on this slide when we talk about employer engagement. Sure. So in this context, if we could um, think, it's not in the employer isn't just the business owner or small business owner, right? It could be the HR director, it could be the foreman on the job, it could be the worker that's actually performing the task within the um, company. So um, this is sort of um, employer is going to be all inclusive of, um, you know, folks that work with and for um, that um, employer that you're trying to engage, right? So for instance, if it's, you're trying to engage Boeing, there's also the machinist workers, um, machinist union that could also be at your table. That's great. Thank you, Carrie. Throughout a lot of our slides, we just refer to the language of employer engagement, but we wanted to help add, um, add some context to that. So why does it even matter? And we, we first like to consider the role, <coughs> excuse me, of career and technical education in economic development. And the fact that a skilled workforce has become one of the main factors a company uses to determine where they're going to locate or expand their business. So when we think about a 21st century skilled workforce, we ask ourselves, how do we recruit, train, and retain them? And we are here to tell you that employer engagement is paramount. It is key. It is top priority. So um, these are um, the elements um, for success for those advisory committees. So um, employer engagement is more than just convening an advisory committee, and that meets um, with the college periodically or a one-off project. Like these elements for success um, are interwoven um, to um, all of your um, engagements um, and probably each of your advisory committee meetings as you have them um, set up and planned out. Next slide. Did I miss something? Sorry about Maybe. that, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> We're new to this button pushing slash zoom thing, I, so. <laughs> I was eagerly awaiting the next slide and I forgot I had to push the button. <laughs> All right. So um, again, I want to um, sort of like as we talk about defining employer engagement, that this is, um, again, um, 
all of those levels of um, uh, workers at an employer site. Um, so um, this is our the definition of how um, we're going to, you should engage in employer, with employers. Um, we're going to go through each of these um, bullet points extensively. Um, and we'll be going into more examples of what, what, what that can look like. Okay, so continuous, that long-term relationship. Um, <clears throat> you know, don't um, sort of like, bring in a, we need a checkbox, right? A labor member for um, our advisory committee. And then you only engage with that um, individual, you know, once or twice or three times in that year at the advisory committee for that hour and a half. <coughs> so part of my work is um, when I recruit labor members to your advisory committee member uh, meetings, um, I will have gone through a training with them so that, that when they show up at your doorstep, they understand what um, an advisory committee member um, does and what the community college um, sort of looks to them for their expertise. So they come to your door um, hoping to not have um, a short-term transaction. Um, and then on an as-needed basis, um, that can be kind of frustrating. Um, I see that most often um, in grant applications, right? So we have a USDOL grant application around, um, you know, construction, and um, we're going to re reach out to um, Christy and her board members um, so that she can get everyone on board to write a letter of expert of um, of support, um, and that's the only transaction you have. Like you want to have a relationship with these individuals and not, um, not only use them for um, on an as needed basis. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a frog in my throat, so I. <clears throat> I'll get there. <clears throat> of course, the frog in my throat is going to stop happening at ten o'clock or eleven when this presentation is over. So there's that. <clears throat> So empowering your employers, your workers. Um, and that can look like <clears throat> if you are doing, you decide to go after a grant application and you have them be part of that application and then part of that implementation, <clears throat> give them work to do, right? <clears throat> and then also um, have uh, leadership roles defined for them, right? So um, maybe it's, not just the chair of your committee, maybe there's some subcommittee work that can happen off to the side and they can bring um, folks back in. Um, maybe it's asking them like where um, and when is a good time to meet for your advisory committee. So maybe that's at, you know, 6.30 a.m. Um, at a, in a college or a high school gym, or it could be in the evening at a union hall. Like what when and where is it most convenient for the group? And how can they, um, <clears throat> they give you feedback on that? Next slide. Did I miss anything, Jamie, on that? Nope. Okay. Great. <clears throat> okay, so the, the strategery of it all. Um, <laughs> identify and define those outcomes, right? Or the desired results. And that um, really is, um, sort of strategic planning, right? So, um, and that can be, you know, what do you want this advisory committee to look like in the next year, two, five years? What's our plan for the program? And then also, who are at the table and, um, and what could we, what could those goals be while they're there, right? So, what, who are the stakeholders? Are they at the table or not? And then what, what would your goals be? And then comprehensive, right? Engaging those employers in a variety of issues. So that can be, again, um, curriculum development. It could be having um, on the site, on job site training opportunities. It could be, hey, can you make a video so we can post this um, for our students in one of our classes? Um, making sure that you, um, they're not, it's not just 
a meeting that they're showing up to and ask them how else they would like to be engaged in that. Jamie, is there anything else you'd add to that? No, I think okay. that's perfect. Okay. So also, I'm sorry, Carrie. Yes. Sorry about that. I, the, the sound went out just for a second on my side. Um, so we think of, of making sure that this relationship is mutually valuable. I think it's easy for, for all of us in, 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 our, in our daily work life to just be sort of consumed about what, what we need and what our needs are and, and what the needs of, you know, we, we have to fulfill these responsibilities related to this board and, and it's all about me, me, me and us, us, us and what's important, what's important to us. Um, it's important to think about, to, to recognize that, that, that we sort of automatically think that way, but if we're going to build these, um, these long-term um, valuable relationships with employers, we have to always consider them. What's, what's in it for them? Is there value for them? Um, let's work together on solving problems um, and, and let's create value for both sides of, of the labor market. And, and always maintaining the, the collaborative mindset. Um, you know, when you, when you go down that path of, you know, being, being focused on just what, what your needs are, the college needs or your, your particular program or board, um, step out of that for a second and think, wow, I've got, I've got this entire pool of, of um, potential partners that together we could we could collaborate we could have amazing you know an amazing vision for for the future and 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 see that as as a real positive being able to um to invest the time and and make those connections and and see possibilities where where others may see barriers and limitations and i don't have time and, and that sort of thing so making sure that we have that collaborative mindset and with, with always an eye to making this a mutually valuable partnership. And also, when we talk about an intensive partnership, we really mean going in, in depth, not just having an employer at the table for the, yeah, yeah, we're all in this together, sort of high level um, conversations, but, but going in depth often about very specific skill sets the, the um, long-term economic needs, um, being willing to hear regularly, are your programs meeting the needs of employers or are there frustrations or are there things that they wish you would be doing differently? Um, be willing to go deep um, often with the employers. That, that helps them to know that you're serious about having them at the table as, as a true partner um, and that you're willing to listen to, to feedback all along the way. Um, that just really helps to to inspire and and um, sort of solidify that that longer term relationship. We also think of this as as wide ranging and institutionally varied. And and what do we mean by that? Well, engaging a variety of employers using varied methods. It's really easy to think of you know oh we need we need more partners we need more representation on the board. Well, who do we know? Um, that, that type of thinking leads you to just, you know, a, a, you know, one sort of channel, one way that you kind of go about uh, engaging with people and, and finding new people, uh, new representation rather. Um, so use, use, different, use different methods. Don't just rely on, on one. Um, and, and also engaging employers through a number of different ways um you know think outside the box not not just um you know one contact that you have with a with a particular group but think about all the other ways that you can connect with people through different channels um industry and professional associations we offer you some examples here chambers of commerce labor management training partnerships um etc there's there's all kinds of different ways to to think about and and see opportunities for connecting with um with a a wide range of, of potential partnerships, potential employers. 
Carrie, did I, I miss could, Yeah, no, I was just going to say if I could add um, that um, it, it takes some, um, some thinking and some courage to sort of reach outside of your norm, your norms of relationships. And the exact example I'm going to bring up is um, there was a grant application around expanding registered apprenticeship. Um, and I contacted Jamie and said, hey, I think that there's a real opportunity here to start and or expand a, a registered apprenticeship around paralegal. Um, Jamie, that was registered apprenticeship wasn't in Jamie's wheelhouse before we had that conversation. Um, and she said, I don't know if I know how to do this. And I said, well, I got you. Like, trust me, it's going to be okay. And ended up being okay. It was a mess for a while, but it was okay. Um, but I would say that sort of open yourself up to, to um, like, uh, either seek out or accept um, help from um, folks that aren't normally in your sort of wheelhouse of engagement is what I would add to that. Perfect. Thank you so much. In, in all of this, you're going to hear us tell you to always consider the partner perspective. And I know I, I mentioned that already, but we're, we're going to want to, we're going to want to drill that home, um, making sure that you're, you're just always thinking about what, what's in it for the employer? Why would they want to come to the table? You know, uh, what, what, what is it that, that we have to offer? And, and what is it that, that would not only bring them to the table, but keep them at the table and keep them excited and engaged and inspired. So we have a number of considerations here for effective engagement and making sure that you're always working towards creating that mutually beneficial partnership. And noting up front that, that their participation equals money, not just time. There's got to be something in it for them. Um, in, in my own work as the Center of Excellence Director, we, we have an, an advisory board and I just went through, we had a couple of people leave <clears throat> their positions and, and move on and so I'm, I'm looking at, at replacing them and one in particular said, I need all, I, I think that I can join the board, but I need some written documentation. My supervisors want to know a little bit more about <clears throat> the Center of Excellence, what this commitment is, um, I, if I'm going to have to travel to meetings in the future, they need details on that. Um, so it, it's, it's important to think, um, think of it that way, not just, well, we, you know, we are who we are and people would want, should want to come to us. We always need to focus on, on them and, and know that something's got to be in it for them and, and make sure that they can see that value up front. In addition, once, once you do make that connection, they, they've got to feel that their voice is not, is not just heard, but, but you actually value what they're, what they're bringing to the table and that the advice that they give actually makes a difference and that that is legitimately taken into consideration when important decisions are being made, program changes are being discussed, that sort of thing. They don't want to feel like you're checking a box by having me at the table. You don't really care about what I have to say. You guys have already sort of made your own decisions. Um, so making sure that that's authentic and, and that they feel like you are hearing them every step of the way and that you're tapping into their expertise. Carrie, please jump right in. Well, I was going to say, um, um, set up scenarios where you ask, ask for input frequently in terms of their voice not being heard, right? So um, when I'm in meetings, I have no problem um, voicing, um, asking questions and voicing my concerns. And I found that others sort of rely on me to sort of like step into it and ask the question, clarifying questions. Um, but so most are not comfortable with that. So also um, um, in that making sure that their voice is heard is giving them, giving those members opportunity, ask the question, like any questions, et cetera. Etc. Sorry. That's great. Thank you very much. Making their participation user friendly uh, as well. Um, making it, it, you know, they understand clearly how they participate. Um, it doesn't cost a lot of money. It, it uh, isn't a huge drain on time. They're very clear about what the need is. 
how they can participate. And also, <clears throat> Carrie already talked about sort of celebrating successes together, um, but along the way, um, pointing out changes that were initiated by their suggestions. You know, a year ago when you first joined our board, <clears throat> you, I'm sorry, I've got a frog in my throat too, just like Carrie. Um, uh, you know, a year ago, you- Don't worry, <laughs> it'll clear up at 11. <laughs> <laughs> You and it, you expressed whatever these these two or three concerns when you first you know joined the board and and I'm excited to 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 show now a year later that we've made these changes in response to those concerns so you know pointing those things out along the way so that they they think oh yeah I okay you actually heard what it what I said in the beginning and and um, and you did something about that that's meaningful and that that really goes a long way again and firming up that relationship. Additional considerations here, and we think about translation. So industry and college both have their own lingo. And, um, and I know that we are all guilty of this, especially in the community college system. You all could probably rattle off 10 different acronyms right now that make sense to you, but wouldn't to the rest of the participants in, in this group. Um, so while some of your some of your employer or you know worker partners may understand some of what you're saying, other times we really have sort of college speak and and it's not always clear. And we sit in meetings and we rattle off acronyms and talk about things, and people can get lost. Um, so something as simple as as focusing on translation of that lingo, making sure that you're really clear about who it is you're talking about and what it is you're talking about as you're having these discussions together. And certainly relying on employers to be the ones to help inform the state of the industry and identify skills gaps. Things are always changing, making sure that this is at the forefront of, of your discussion and you are always turning, them, turning to them to say, what are you seeing? What, what can we be doing? How, how can we serve? Do we need to make changes? Um, just being open to, to, to continuously hearing, getting that input, that expert input, but also being willing to um, adapt and, and be flexible and, and make changes. Um, we, also, we also highly recommend engaging with employers in their environment. And we'll touch on this a couple times too throughout the presentation. That's something important that, that we don't always think about. We think of booking a room on our campus or you know in our building or whatever, and people will just continue to come to to us for for meetings and for engagement. And and you know what? Why wouldn't they? Well, it's it's important to to think about. You know, we we want to come to you. Would would you know, maybe you get to a point where the employer is willing to host a meeting or we want to come and we want to, if you haven't already, tour your facility a couple of times a year and, and, and meet those, you know, your, your coworkers, your supervisors, get to know the people in your environment. Um, those are things that we just, we don't always think about, but those, um, the, the, it, it's worth it to think about committing that, that kind of time to, show the employer that you value him or her and that you are interested in coming to, to their environment to learn a lot more um, about, about what they do. And, and um, again, always thinking back to that mutually beneficial partnership. And I Here would also that. add that um, as, you know, cause we're all on Zoom, right? So as the sort of like um, our world starts to open back up again, how do we um, continue that engagement maybe in a hybrid model, right? So that we have um, a part um, uh, virtual opportunities for folks that aren't able to meet the, make the in meeting person. That's a really great suggestion. And I was just reading an, an article the other day on similar similar topic that, that talked about in this day and age of, of Zoom, maintaining communication with boards is, is essential because you're physically apart so much more now than, than you ever have been. And so even if it's just, uh, you know, every couple of weeks or a monthly sort of touch to, hey, here's, here's what's happening, here's a cool, something that happened over the last month, or if there's a student success story to share, something that, that again, shows them you're committed to that relationship. Um, 
and even from a distance, you, you certainly value that, that communication, maintaining that, that relationship. <clears throat> Showing that you care and valuing employers' time it might seem really simple, um, but these are things that we've heard as frustrations um, along the way uh, in terms of, of making efficient use of time, starting and ending meetings on time. We all know how difficult that can be sometimes. You, you start a little bit late, you know, people come late, um, and then whatever, your meeting goes till noon, but you still have like three things on your agenda to discuss, and so you end up going until 1245. Um, those kinds of things get really frustrating to, to members when the start and end times are not respected. So um, assigning roles and responsibilities to, to the, the, the board ahead of time so people know exactly who's doing what and and, and if, I was going to say making efficient use of time in terms of a, a good solid agenda up front and you know clearly we've got to to touch on points one two and three and then if we have time maybe we will get to the others um, th those are important things to to your partners and and again they may seem simple but they're, they're they really are meaningful especially in the long term Offering at least one to two months notice um, on, on meetings, a couple months, um, I, we would recommend at least some go ahead and set an entire year's schedule and they can modify as they go if necessary. But getting, how often do we all hear that? Got to get that meeting on my calendar, my calendar's filling up. So I, that probably goes without saying. One of, the, one of the biggest frustrations we've heard is like, you know, don't send me a meeting for next Tuesday. It's already Friday. I'm busy. And, and you know, that, that doesn't make me feel good. That makes me feel like you have an emergency last minute here and you need my input. You need me at the table, but you don't really care. If you did, this would have been planned at least a month ago or, or longer. And so always keep that in mind, how that will be perceived um, by the employer if you're constantly doing all that sort of last minute stuff. It's got to work best for the, for the, for the partner, think of college and, and staff needs, your needs as, as secondary. What works best for you? How can we work around your schedule? And that includes getting creative with meeting times and locations. What works for you? And I always give the story that when I was um, the director of, of the South King County Tech Prep Consortium a number of, of years ago, a dual credit program, we had relationships with 13 different school districts, CTE directors, and we were guilty of that. We were guilty of scheduling the meetings at the colleges and just expected them to, to sort of come to us. Um, and we sort of shifted our thinking and, and went back to them and, and, and reset the whole scheduling process and tell us what works for you. We, we want to do our best to work around you. And almost unanimously, they said, seven o'clock in the morning over breakfast somewhere would be ideal for us because then we can be done out of there by 8 30 get back to our district offices and we still have the rest of the day to put in so great we started reserving board meeting space at the poodle dog restaurant in fife and and hosted meetings and and almost every time we, we had um close to 100 percent um, participation so just some of those small shifts in, in the way you think, the way you schedule, the way who, you know, prioritizing the needs of the employers can make a really big difference. Carrie, anything you want to add? No, because I just love that poodle dog um, I example. Do. <laughs> Six thirty. And, and I just I'm love gonna, the poodle I dog. I bacon and eggs <laughs> and you get all my... <laughs> Seriously. How come we're not all at the poodle dog right now? I know. Well, there's a pandemic, but I know, dang it. Maybe the next time. Next year's yeah, follow-up. As soon as there's we... not, then I say we all have this meeting at the poodle dog. <laughs> that that really ended up being a lot of fun to meet at the poodle dog and then someone else said, How about we try the black bear in Federal Way? And so it was kind of fun for people to throw out their favorite breakfast place and we kind of made our way around South King County early in the morning. And, and I just loved hear, seeing everybody show up. That's what worked best for them. So, so making our, our own needs secondary um, really was, was key there. So here is an, a ladder of employer engagement. And I believe that this also came from the same report from the Jobs, um, Jobs for the Future. 
And this reflects a continuum of activities that support partnerships. And each level you'll see um, involves deeper engagement uh, and integration of employers into the work. Um, you, you can see the key employer role, stage of the relationship, as well as specific activity examples. Um, it's, it's important to think of, of this uh, as sort of a continuum and that it's possible to have relationships with people that are at different levels and, and what you can do to get from level one up to level five. And some of, some of the little things that we're talking about can, can go a long way in establishing the trust and, and, and that, you know, really building that working relationship that, that can help sort of propel you from some of those lower levels into the, the, the higher levels where you then can, can consider we've got this employer who's been with us now for a couple of years and we've been, we, you know, we've got this really great relationship and we consider this person a full strategic partner. Well, you know, some of the, some of the partnerships that you might have will stay down at, at maybe a level one, two, three for, for any number of reasons. And maybe it's that that person only has, you know, a really limited amount of time to contribute to a board, but he or she has some fabulous expertise to share and would be such a good voice to have on the board. They just don't have the time um, as maybe a, a another member, um, but that's okay. And that's still, that's still valued. Um, so I think just, just knowing that there's, there's different possibilities here in terms of, of engagement and engaging at different levels. And once you start asking them to, to do some additional work, some of them jump at the opportunity and have told us, nobody ever asks me to do that. All, all they want me to do is come to a meeting. I was never asked to chair a subcommittee or you know, provide input some, some different way or attend a different meeting with college leadership whatever it might be. So a lot of times they feel like I just was never asked, but I would be glad to do a little bit more um, because I have more in me to share and I'm excited about, about, um, about this relationship. So this is just, just something for, and, and we'll provide this presentation afterwards as well, something for you to go back and, and, and look at, but just noting that there's, like, there's different levels and different possibilities here with the relationships that you have. And this is Carrie, um, and I would say that there's no um, there's no wrong um, or bad sort of like level to be in. Um, so um, allowing your um, advisory members um, the grace, um, if they can either self-identify sort of what level they think they're in, or you can um, sort of have that in the back of your mind. But, um, and I say that because <clears throat> I'm on a different board altogether outside of an advisory committee. And um, I only have the capacity um, to be advising. Um, I see spaces where I could step into um, a, those different levels and I just don't have capacity at the moment to be able to do that. Chris, might this be a good time for another poll? I know you've got one related to... Um, There's a question to, in the chat, oh. too. Yes, um, Jacob is asking, at what level do you see the productive advisory committees functioning? For me personally, I feel like it's, you have members in all five of those categories. The yep. goal is not to get to everyone to leading, but to have um, everyone functioning in each of those levels. Jamie, do you see it otherwise? I 100% agree, and and it's important. I think, you know, you might get stuck in, in a pattern of thinking, you know, this person's doing more. How come these other three people aren't doing more? And and I, you know, you think, well, they they all should be should be doing more and should be serving at the level four or five. Um, but that's just not the case. And, and so it, it's helpful, I think, to be able to recognize we've got someone who's, who's truly a level one or a, or a level two or three, and, and that's where they're going to stay. And that's okay. And, and we, will, um, we will maximize the, the value of, of that person and, and 
make sure that our relationship is just as strong as someone that that's at a level five. Um, so I think just having that acknowledgement up front that there's people across all levels is good, and and you're not all you're not finding yourself frustrated that what's wrong with this level two person? I wish they had more time, or they, you know, step up more, or whatever. No, that's okay. This person is awesome, and they they contribute. Um, so much and 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 are, are so you know their, their voice is valuable to the board they can't do a lot extra but that's okay um so recognizing and valuing that i i yes that was my long answer to yes i agree with you carrie mm -hmm. and i would also add that um uh i served on an advisory committee um where the um, director of the program pulled to get pulled out um those advisory committee members that were sort of like at the level four and five engagement um and create a sort of a subcommittee um, of those folks as well um, and that really helped in um moving the entire committee towards like strategic planning etc so um if you if if you're feeling like you can identify um a handful of folks um, you could also break up your subcommittee according to that as well. So, Jamie, is the poll you were wanting the engagement poll we developed? Sure. Okay. How about we do that? Okay. I will launch that now. The results should be showing now. I answered poorly engaged only because it looked like I needed to answer to clear that off my screen. So that percentage should be just a little less, but it still looks like that's that's the majority. I answered adequately engaged to counteract what I knew you were going to do, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so we negated each other's votes. Beautiful. Well, and I think this is really interesting um, to see, you know, very, there's not very many that feel like their, their board members are completely or, or mostly engaged. Some feel like they're adequately engaged. Um, many feel poorly engaged um, and some not engaged at all. Okay. That's interesting. Chris, thank okay. you for that. And Moving right along. Carrie? All right. So um, just here's some additional ideas of engagement. Um, and um, we've, we've given some examples as we've moved through this, um, but certainly um, this is not an inclusive um, idea um, uh, bullet slide. Um, Work-based learning opportunities. <clears throat> and that's... Um, uh, student connections, I love that. Um, those are sort of like on your your career fairs, right? Um, or um, having allowing your students um, to um, set up informational interviews with your advisory committee members, resume reviews, um, curriculum and program development. I see this um, a lot in terms of um, uh, the expertise that are at, that are at the table, right? So in construction, um, you know, some folks are moving towards um, sort of online instruction. So what does that look like? Um, legislative and policy advocacy. I cannot stress this to you enough, and I'm going to give you an example of this. Um, so uh, the state board um, is wanting to um, uh, add um, uh, the money to their ask for their buildings um, on your college campuses. And um, they had the wherewithal to engage um, this Washington State Labor Council and the building trades, right? 
who basically um, are doing commercial construction. And so how can we like not only have a state agency make it ask to the legislature, but also engage our labor and business partners because um, that those builds on your college campus are um, well-paying jobs for your students, right, in your community. So it's a win for, for everyone. Um, guest speakers can't um, also um, stress that enough. And if you um, need help with your guest speakers, either use your advisory committee members for your guest classroom speakers or invite them to um, ask others within their community. And then um, the credential recognition, like, um, you know, is this credential that we're saying is, uh, you know, on the pathway, is it really? Um, and if it's not, um, how does it get changed and or updated? <clears throat> Jamie, do you have anything to add? <clears throat> I don't. Okay. So recruitment and retention, know your employers of your industry. Um, and that can be, um, you know, Googling it. Um, that can be looking at prior um, advisory committee lists to see um, what employers um, and workers have been at the table before. And then develop that strategy to um, get to know them better, right? So, um, and that can also be, um, you know, casting that wide net could include um, using your centers of excellence um, because they are also engaged in um, uh, have advisory committee members from both business and labor as well. Um, and engage those members at multiple levels, right? Again, when we talk about employers, we're really talking about, you know, uh, could be the owner of the business. It could be the HR director within that um, employer. Um, it could be the frontline worker. Um, it's um, all of those, um, those folks can be um, helpful and can help um, create um, a larger diversity for your advisory committee. I, Jamie, is there I anything? May, I would just add, um, I, I think it's really easy to become dependent on a single person at, at an organization. It's a person you've known for years, they've, they've come, you know, they've engaged with the board for years, that type of thing, and suddenly they're gone, they retire, they get, they get a new job and you go, oh my goodness, this person has been so beneficial, this relationship has been so beneficial, but we don't know anybody else. We don't know any of that person's other supervisors, coworkers, you know, team members at, at, their, at, at their place of business. And so um, it, it helps to really limit your dependence on just a single person um, by, by casting that wide net that Carrie was talking about. Right. So bringing that value to the table, like what is it that um, your program, your college, um, what's the value add for the employer? Excuse me, I have to talk or cough. Jamie, can you take this? <laughs> yes, yes. Bringing value to the table, um, again, making sure that you're, you're clear about what your institution can offer and recognizing too, I read another article that said, Engaging with higher education is not always at the top of an employer's priority list. We might feel like it is or it should be, um, but it, it, it isn't necessarily. And so what, what are we bringing to the table that, that is of value to them? Um, and again, being able to talk about current courses, programs of study, things like that. Is, is it relevant? Let's talk about changes, that, that kind of thing. Making sure that they understand um, the 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 value to the relationship and to their time coming to the table. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I got um, you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, those new members, right? So provide that formal welcome pack. Um, and what I would say um, is that, again, the labor members that um, I've recruited for your advisory committees um, have um, already gone through sort of a short training about sort of what an advisory committee member or um, how they engage, what that um, program um, could entail, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but beyond that, providing that welcome packet to everyone 
um, what's your contact information, right? What are the contact information of the other committee members? They may already have a working relationship um, outside of your um, advisory committee. And to be able to um, help make those connections that sort of like, oh yeah, you're on, you're at the chamber while you're also at, you know, Renton Community College. Ask them again um, to share at meetings. And I would say that is true for all of your members, but particularly your newer members, right? Create a um, safe space for um, them to share. And then nurture that relationship from the start. Um, be excited, you know, you're excited to have them um, be at their committee, um, at your advisory meeting and show that same enthusiasm, you know, a year later, um, right before you go into your meeting at the pool dog. <laughs> like, just create, um, you know, create kindness and opportunity, I would say. All right, next slide. And again, um, inspire that collaboration. Um, breakout groups, um, either during your committee meeting, um, subcommittees um, off to the side. Um, this is a real opportunity for you to sort of like set the, ta the table and the tone for that interaction, that networking, that collaboration, both at your table and then outside of your um, organization. Magic happens um, both on the day of your meeting and then within that, you know, four or five months between. And then consider implementing term limits. And some people are like, what? And others are like, yeah, how do we do it? So um, we all know that we've had some advisory committee members that um, have stayed on probably much longer on your committee than, um, than is comfortable for everyone. How am I saying this politically correct? You're doing, <laughs> but you're doing well, you're right. doing well. Um, and so the, sort of what we found a tip, right, is the easiest is sort of like set up term limits. And these are whatever you all decide, right? They can be, these are faux term limits. They're not sort of in policy or WAC or procedure um, that are anywhere formalized. Um, but sort of go, hey, you know, we want you, oh, sorry. Okay. We want you to, um, you know, commit we want your commitment for two to three years. And then renew those commitments, right? And um, if the board member that's been on your committee for 30 years, um, after you've started this implementation and you're like, you know, we would like somebody new, you can at the end of that term say, you know, send a letter saying, thank you so much for your term. You know, we have so valued everything you've brought to the table and, um, and leave it at that. And then the folks that you want to um, bring back after that three years, you'd be like, hey, thank you so much for serving. We hope you would consider um, staying on for another term. Jamie, did I get that? 100%. Yep. I, I think that's great. And, um, you know, you can, that can be a delicate subject that that's tough and and we've heard this concern from a lot of people um for for different reasons what why you know a, a long-term board member um I, I yeah how do i say that right they, they would they would like to keep they just want to keep the board representation fresh it's it's just it's that simple and and that's difficult when you when you have long-time uh, board members that have, have been there for 20 years sort of stuck in, in their, their thinking. And, and so, you know, it, it can be going back to the group and, and being able to say, hey, I, I went through a training like this and here's something that, here's a tip that, that we heard and that a lot of, of um, college advisory boards are, are implementing. And that's a really cool way for us to keep our representation fresh. You know, a few years down the road as, as, um, as we, engage with new employers, you know, that that's going to, something like that would help us to, to be sure that, that our, our board rep representation is kind of always changing and fresh. So you, you sort of frame it that way instead of, huh, we found a way to deal with whatever this person or this person or this, the, the, the struggles that we're having on, on our board. And so um, that, that's just, that's one of the biggest tips that we, that we share and, and uh, 
something to, to build in and, and, and use if, if, if you need it. it it's, it's there to sort of lean on. And we have Sam, like we have, there's a toolbox, right, of, um, and Jamie will share that link maybe in the chat, but there is a toolbox for um, you all to be able to use that includes a sample um, term limit letter. I will share everything with Chris after our president. Not only will we share our PowerPoint, but I will share the, the link to the toolbox as well that's got various resources and things for you, absolutely. Thank you. I'll make sure that gets distributed. Great. Thanks. So labor involvement, why, um, why and how does um, labor advocate for the career and technical college system? So this, um, this slide and the next slide was pulled together for a presentation that um, <clears throat> labor trustees did at the National Trustee College Trustee um, Association Conference. And um, what I would say to you is that um, labor is involved in, you know, the forms of government, right, that would figure out what programs and policies and funding should go to the community college system. We're part of the education system in terms of, um, you know, we provide um, both folks at the advisory committee level, at, you know, board of trustees, um, and all levels of the community college system, but also in our community, right? Our um, our union brothers and sisters um, have either gone through a community college program or have um, parents and or children that have gone through the program and to sort of, uh, or a program, um, to sort of stress that. So once every year, um, our convention, we have an annual convention where about four to 500 union members show up and we talk about various things. Um, and we don't normally agree on 100% of anything, um, but we had a presentation and a conversation about uh, the community technical college system where the president of the State Labor Council asked the question, how many of you have been touched by the community college system? Like you've been in it or you have family members that have been in it. I'm telling you, we never 100% agree on anything. 100% of those hands went up, right? So. We are, we are your students. We um, have um, parents and children that are in the, the college system, and we serve the same um, groups of individuals that you, that you serve, right? With a um, <clears throat> lens on equity, et cetera. <clears throat> Next slide, sorry. Oh. This is basically <laughs> the slide PowerPoint, the, the bullet points of what I just said. So why we're it, like, we are students. Um, what I also say is that um, registered apprenticeship is um, very integrated into the community and technical college system, right? So um, a lot of our members, um, this iron worker in particular, um, you know, uh, when it's time for them to get um, on the job or uh, their educational component of it, um, they have, um, you know, they have a um, space either at the community college or there is um, space at a training center where the community college is accredited that education. And <clears throat> we believe in opportunity for all students and workers, right? Like we want, <clears throat> we want to see, and with a lens of equity and inclusion, we want to see, um, everyone take advantage of the education that um, is appropriate for their um, employment. And hopefully that involves either a registered apprenticeship or a community college system. Jamie, do you have anything to add to that? I, I don't. Not that you're the labor lady, I am technically. So. You are the labor lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Moving right along. Okay. Yeah. So we we've got a couple of of slides to share specifically around strategies for embracing um, and integrating diversity in an inclusive environment. That's hard sometimes to think about. You know, not only the basics of oh my gosh, I I don't even feel like I have the time, let alone how do I worry about diversifying the board. Um, so here, here's just some things to think about, um, hopefully to get you thinking, and then we're excited to be able to move into a, 
a brief breakout discussion to, to let you share with each other as well. We talked about this already, casting a wide net. When you're thinking of, we gotta get new members, don't just rely on who do, who do we know, who do you know, who's our one person at that one place that we think might, might be a good fit. Think, uh, think creatively, um, sort of wipe that slate clean and, and, and know, gosh, we, sky's the limit. You know, we, we should be thinking bigger and, and broader than just that, that one person, that, that one connection that we have. Communication within the board. What do you mean when you talk about wanting a diverse board? Have, have you had, and if you haven't, have regular and open thoughtful discussions as a group um, to consider how you and, and your college, your constituents would benefit from, from diversity within the board and make sure that you're all clear in terms of, of what, you, what you mean by that exactly. Um, what, what does board representation look like now? And what, what would you like it to be? Um, ha have you even had any of those conversations? Um, considering self-assessments, um, consider, uh, gosh, there's a number of them, of them that we could recommend um, on diversity, equity, and inclusion. <clears throat> That's something that can be challenging and, and, and difficult to, to look inside of yourself to, to be able to identify um, areas of, of growth and and you know, let's take a look at what what each individual brings to the table, and and what do we as a group want to focus on? Where are our areas of of need and and growth? Regularly talking about it and sharing um, uh, resources related to diversity, equity, and inclusion um, by making by by putting that sort of at the forefront of of your discussion, your board materials. Um, always thinking of of business through the, the DEI lens, then, then the board becomes um, more comfortable with, with that as a legitimate and authentic commitment. You, you don't just have a single conversation like, oh, I think, we need, I think we need a more diverse board, and then that's where the conversation sits. That doesn't get you anywhere. So, so making sure that this is part of your regular conversation and sharing and, and communication with each other and committing to learning about it and, um, and just stimulating that intentional conversation about, about your commitment to it. And you could go a step further and even formalize a, a commitment. And it could be something as simple as just adopting an, an, a statement that, that talks about your, you know, the, your group's work, your, your the, the value of diversity, your commitment um, to establishing this, this inclusive environment. Um, sometimes having that, going through the, you know, taking the time, and, and it might take several months to, to have all of that conversation and communication and then get to a point where you actually write out a, a statement. Um, that can be very powerful and, and is something that, that you maybe hadn't thought of um, until now, but that's something that you could lean back on also as you're recruiting new members, um, making it really clear what you stand for and, and the work that you've done as, as a group or, um, or you as, as the, the, the chair, or what, you know, whatever it might be, um, that, that's something to think about. And, and being proactive um, and in terms of seeking board representation that's different from the usual members similar to what we've talked about um, in, in a few previous slides. Avoiding tokenism. There is no, I think this probably goes without saying, there's, there's no board member that wants to be the one that just fills a quota. And, um, and it's not fair to, to, to bring one person on the board and, and think, ah, oh, look, look at what we did. We made some great change. We've got a, a, a new person on the board that, that somehow represents some, some diversity. Um, th that, that's not okay either. And so making sure that you're not, you know, you're not going down the path of, of really kind of checking a box like, yeah, yeah, we, we, we know we want to do this. And so, you know, as I can, or, you know, as, as we can, we'll pull a new member or whatever on, onto the board and be able to say, look what we did. Um, that that that's not the right way to that's not right the, the right way to go about it at least keep that in mind be sure that you're not bringing someone on the board that's going to feel like oh my gosh really they, 
why am I here? Um, and also setting concrete and actionable goals. Know that change will not happen overnight. This is not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to change. If you're bored right now is, is whatever, it's, it's not diverse. People are, are they're, they're not all that engaged. You, you have trouble getting people to even respond or show up to meetings. Um, it, it's okay. You're, you're in a good place to, to learn some of these things and, and implement two or three things at a time um, or, you know, setting some very specific, concrete, actionable goals. We're going to have conversation, you know, even if the board is kind of small right now, we're going to have conversation about our commitment to, to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what does that mean for us? And what change do we want to see come from that? And within a year, we'd like to see X happen. Um, that, that type of thing, setting, setting those sorts of, of concrete, actionable goals that makes it a little bit easier of a process rather than this big sort of um, overwhelming feeling like, oh, what, what am I going to do to kind of fix this board and nothing's quite working. Um, baby steps, baby steps um, can, can make a big and difference. If I could say in, in terms of that, adding to that, it won't happen overnight. Now, granted, um, labor movement, um, labor unions may move sm slower than most. Um, but when I started working with the State Labor Council 30 years ago, um, there was only one other woman um, uh, on uh, staff um, that wasn't in a secretarial pool. Um, and the, all the men were white. Um, fast forward to now, um, there was, uh, um, as hiring happened throughout the years, there was um, an eye to um, diversity and inclusion. Um, and our staff has never been more diverse. It's crazy how diverse it is now, and I love it. Um, but it's taken a long, long time for us to get to that space. So um, I don't want, I don't wish 30 years on anybody. <laughs> um, but it, it can't, it, it, change does not happen overnight. Chris, might this be, a, we're, we're nearing the, the end of our, of our time. Might this be a good opportunity for one last poll? You bet. Um, do you have a preference? I think you had a poll related to, um, do I remember correctly, related to board diversity? Definitely. I can okay. pick that up. Um, are we wanting member diversity or industry diversity? A member based on what you're doing, I'm guessing, right? Yes, that sounds great. Okay, here we go. Or you could do both. <laughs> okay. Let me share the results. Okay, so it looks like a majority are in the camp of needing, uh, seeing room for improvement or uh, really needing to work on it. We, we, that's good, that's interesting to note. And how about, Chris, why don't we just quickly do the, the second poll that you, that you created also related to the industry diversity? You bet. Okay, and I'll share now. Okay. So, in terms of representation, it looks like about three quarters of you either say no or that there's there's some room for for improvement. Okay. 
those are those are really good things to note. And we we've got about 15 minutes left total, so um, we'll we'll move through these last couple of slides, and then we hope to to um, move into a, a brief um, breakout a discussion, so that you have an opportunity to share with each other a little bit. In conclusion, you've heard a number of these things throughout the presentation. Establish the shared value. There's so many different ways that 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 um, you can connect with with employers um, and and collaborate. And the relationship really does yield rich benefits on both sides. It can um, if you put in the time um, and engage strategically from from the beginning. Build that that trusting uh, relationship. Consider that ladder of engagement where people are um, and know that it's okay to be at, at different levels. Um, and you know, maybe part of your strategy is you've got, you've got a couple people down at the advising level um, that, that, uh, that serve in that capacity and serve really well. Um, and then a few others that are, that are up higher on, on the ladder. And so um, just being aware of that and, and um, Helping to draw really the best benefit from from everybody, depending upon which which level they they are. We've said it. It takes time. It it just flat out takes time. But moving in that direction is such an important first step, and it it is challenging, and and it does demand a lot of your time. And that's something else that we hear from colleges like, my plate is so full. How on earth am am I gonna going to find the time to to properly invest into this relationship but but know that it is it is worth it um, it is it is worth the challenge and, and if you at least get moving in that direction one rock solid partnership it will will lead to the next and that will um, that will lead to a whole perhaps different network of, of people that you didn't have the year prior that that type of thing and so um, focusing on on what's in it for the employers, the benefit to employers, and, and building that, that mutually valuable relationship, it will pay off in the end, and it's totally worth the challenge and the time. Carrie, did you have anything else to add there? No, no, but I'm wondering okay. if um, we only have 15 people on, right? Oh. Maybe we don't do a breakout room, maybe we just do this collectively. I for love the it. Next, like 10 minutes, does that work okay? Chris, is that okay? Yes, that it's it's your ball, it's your ball game. I think okay. that's wonderful. <laughs> Just want to make it easy for folks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe um, if you don't want to um, speak up, you can put some of these answers to the questions in chat. So what does good employer engagement look like? Are there other ideas out there um, that we haven't hit on um, that you have seen? Um, that could look um, we could use as examples for other presentations. Sorry, I'm reading I'm reading chat as I'm talking. <laughs> Easily distracted squirrel. <laughs> Sorry, I thought it would be helpful to have there. Nope, totally. Yep. The slide yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is your part where you guys get to step in and tell us, you know, what that looks like, or. If you don't know what that looks like, what are some big, what are your some of your biggest challenges? Like, you know, can we collectively start to hear what those are and then um, try to provide provide an assist? I think for me, the biggest um, uh, thing that has worked really well is inviting um, industry partners to do mock interviews for students. I know you talked about that in your presentation. Um, but that's really beneficial for them as well as the students love it because they get really good feedback um, for when they are going to apply for jobs and also when they go to practicum because a lot of them are like, oh, I want that student at my site or, um, wow, let me know when you graduate because I want to hire you. So um, I feel like that has really been a good engagement piece as far as getting employers and a variety of employers, like we have MAs, like that are alumni in the program, we've had um, HR, as well as clinic managers um, involved in the, and they're usually panel interviews, so they're pretty large um, for the students, so.
and that can help with the jitters, right? Kind of work out through some of the what to say and what not to say. Yeah, good. Is there anyone else? Um, Bradley Lee is has added one challenge with current COVID limitations is connecting with partners as many are juggling a lot of new roles and their own challenges. Jamie, do you have any any tips for navigating that? Other than, I mean, in our organization, we just give each give everyone grace. And you're like, all right, well, we'll catch you. You know, make sure you have this meeting on your agenda next, you know, next quarter. Um, you know, we'll be sending out minutes from the meeting so that you know um, what we've what we've discussed or what we want to discuss. Jamie, do you have anything? I I just can relate. I just can so relate. Um, and and I yeah I think as Carrie just said offering grace knowing that everybody's doing the best they can during this time um, additional reminders and and points of contact are helpful um, you know in talking with with a project coordinator recently about something unrelated he said everything these days be it meetings projects whatever everything is just flat out taking like twice as long as as they normally would it's just the the, the times that we're living in and so just you know even as frustrating as that is know that that's the case um, um have patience have have grace um i would say frequent again frequent communication with with board members and and not necessarily hey, you missed a meeting, or hey, you know, what what we need from you, but how are you doing? Want to wanna just, you know, can keep keep you in the loop. Uh, let, let me offer you a quick update as to, you know, a couple cool things that have happened on our side the last couple months. I just want to stay engaged, and I can't wait to see you in our, whatever, our February meeting or something like that. Just those little touch points that, that make people feel like, ah, oh, okay. You, you know that I'm going through a hard time and I'm trying to deal with kids at, at home who are doing this online learning and my life is crazy. Um, just just having some, some um, I think Carrie said it best, ha having some grace, knowing that we will get through this, but it's a tough time for everybody. Um, Jamie, first of all, is it okay if I go ahead and unshare your screen so people can see each other better? Or if you'd like to? Absolutely, let me do that. Thank you. Um, and then I actually have a, there was another comment in the chat um, from Sheila May, and I'm sorry I lost the chat, which is basically around Zoom fatigue. Um, and that, you know, everybody's going through that. People don't want to jump on Zoom again. Um, and before she even asked that, I was curious how, are any of you finding creative ways to connect outside of Zoom um, that, that are working? Um, I would say with um, my close work colleagues and I, um, I, I've been doing group texting, right? So sort of like, hey, thinking about you, or, you know, here's a funny video, or like I shared with you all this morning about the Loki, um, <laughs> like series that's coming out, like adding in some um, sort of life, into that that's happening outside of just work and then also um you know like today so um we're recording this zoom right so those folks that want to um uh like hear what had they had to say but they don't have the three hours today or the two hours to um, be part of this conversation there's an opportunity just to um review this information on their own i think you know but te uh, texting is um, is giving me, um, you can send lots of things to text on text that make people laugh. <laughs> I totally agree with, with Carrie. And if I might add, um, 
Zoom meetings, I, I am totally with you on that too. Zoom fatigue is real. Um, keeping Zoom meetings much shorter than, than regular meetings. Um, um, you know, you might have had a three hour in person meeting. Well, that really needs to become an hour Zoom meeting kind of tops and, and respect people's time. Um, something else that, that we do with a couple of the different advisory boards I have related to different projects, we do late afternoon, we call them happy hour meetings. We, we call them happy hour, uh, you know, mainly because of the time frame. We maybe don't start them until four o'clock, um, but that's an opportunity. I, if nothing more than people feel like, oh, I can sort of let my hair down. I'm coming to the table with my business colleagues and we're still gonna talk work, but it's late in the day. We're all kind of relaxed. Maybe I, you know, just put on my comfy PJ bottoms, whatever it might be. Um, we call them happy hour meetings. And so we, we try and shift, at least <laughs> in your mind, the thinking of, oh my gosh, not another midday, like two hour awful Zoom meeting. Like I get to come together with people that I enjoy and we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna meet for an hour over happy hour and, and still get our business done, but let it be in a little bit more of a, a lighthearted um, kind of fashion. All right, so Chris, you had something that you had is there more in the chat or is there something that you wanted to add? Um, I, in the chat, all that's left is, um, is that Rin agrees that texting is a great idea. Um, here at RTC, we have teams available. Um, so that's something for internal communication that can be really helpful. Uh, I would love to know if anybody has any ideas for outside, um, possibilities like teams but that a lot of people can get into for that group chat um, and if you'd be want to share that with me i'd be glad to spread the word among the people participating in this project so i don't know about teams but um i worked with a film producer who was out of new york on a um uh project and um, we use slack and um, that was super, super helpful. So we were always all on the same page, even though we were in different time zones, um, working on different projects. I, I always knew, like, you just download the, whatever the document is, and we're all on the same page together. Great. The only other thing I have is that for those who are interested in the deliverable after we wrap up, I um, would like to just have five, uh, five minutes just to give you a little overview of that before we send it out. But Carrie and Jamie, I'll return that to you and uh, wait till you've completed your presentation. I see Christy mentioned that GroupMe is a good app to use. Christy, can you just tell us real quick about that? Sure, um, I use it for several different, uh, but, um, I think the nice thing about that one too, and maybe this is Slack, I'm, I'm not familiar with that, but is that you don't see everyone's phone number. So I can send a group message and maybe not everyone would like everyone to have in that group to have their phone number. So that's kind of the nice thing is it keeps that private, um, but is a great way to also send those immediate messages and um, updates, so. You know, Jamie, I was honestly worried we were not going to make an hour and a half, and now I'm worried that we're not going to wrap it up in time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this happens every time. I know. We, we, um, I, we, we didn't have anything more in terms of content except to say we'd love to continue the conversation. We, we hope that this was at least a good starting point if you're struggling in a particular area or wish that something was different about your board. Um, we hope that we gave you a few things to, to think about. And as you go away, if you, if I don't know, if something resonated with you or if you had a, a question or a, want to talk through something, we will make ourselves available anytime. So um, as part of what I send to Chris as our, as our follow-up and the presentation, it's got our contact information on there. And 
Carrie and I are, are happy to jump on the phone or Zoom or whatever, happy hour, you name it, with, with any of you if you want to talk through anything any further. Yeah, at any time. Feel free to contact either one of us. Thank you.